This is Mark Granny, and you should be watching the crew reviews. All right, gentlemen, let's welcome back Mr. Mark Greeny to the show. How are Ooh, you, sir? Here's yeah, Mark back in action. Thank you so much for having me. It's always fun to be with you guys. Yeah. All right. right let's, get, let's get to it. Relentless is number 10 in the Gray Man series. And um, what can you give the audience for a quick 30,000 view of what's happening in your latest book here? Uh, in this book, the hero, Court Gentry, who's a former CIA officer, then he became a kind of a rogue uh freelance assassin and now he's working back with the CIA in a, in a contract uh, on a contract basis he's on a hunt in this book for some missing intelligence officers and in this hunt trying to find these guys around the world he finds this big international conspiracy uh, with the point of which is to draw the United States into war so he and his his mates these people that you've seen in some other gray man books perhaps um, they all work together to try and uh, stop this conspiracy before it, it pulls the U.S. into a war. Yeah. Well, Relentless takes you and takes us to a place very familiar to you, uh, Berlin, Germany, where you have spent some time both traveling as well as living for a short period of time. Um, was this choice because of COVID and their lack of travel options, or had you chosen that prior to the outbreak? I had chosen it prior to the outbreak and my my plan, the reason I chose it is I wanted to write a big spy novel in Berlin. Uh, one of the Tom Clancy books I did, um, uh, Command Authority, the name is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Command yeah. Authority, took place in Berlin and I, and I spent a good bit of time over there. And I thought, okay, for this book, it's a gray man book, it's it's down and dirty. I know the neighborhoods of, of Berlin and I'm going to just rent an apartment just kind of like uh, in, in a rough part of Berlin, not rough, but you know, it's Berlin, it's not that rough, but yeah. you know, and just sort of like a, an, an edgier part of town and I'm gonna live there for a, you know, four or six weeks or something like that. And that was, that was my intention. And then as I started writing the book, obviously COVID happened. I started writing the book in February, planning on doing my travel in May and June and uh, had a place all booked and everything. And, and then COVID happened and I canceled that place. And I was like, well, surely by June, I'll be able to go. <laughs> surely by July, I'll be able to go. Well, the book was due by the end of July to my editor. Yeah. I thought, you know what? I'm gonna write this whole book. And then the early August, I'm gonna go for a couple of weeks. And then in the edits, I'll sort of like, you know, yeah. clean it up a little bit. And then it became pretty obvious by middle of June that we, I wasn't going in August. <laughs> so at that point, um, I have spent a lot of time there, as you said, I'd, I'd researched a book there. I'd lived in Cologne, Germany for a while to study German uh, for several months and, and would take a lot of visits to Berlin because I had friends that had, a, had friends in Berlin. And, um, and then I've been back to Berlin many, many times. I've been back to Germany even more times. I was there a couple of years ago researching red metal with, uh, the book I wrote with Rip Rawlings. Yeah. And so I know German, Germany pretty well. I speak German, I speak crappy German, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> enough, to get me, to, enough to get me by. Actually in Germany, you can get by with English. You, you, uh, yeah. Anybody under like 81 <laughs> <speaks> English, <laughs> not better than I speak German, but better than I speak English. Uh, but, um, but I did do a lot of other research for locations and that sort of thing. So it worked, yeah. it worked out as well as it could for COVID that I had picked a place where I had been before. Um, you know, if, if, if I, if the book was placed in Calcutta or something like that, I would have been in a lot of trouble by the, you know, as we got into the, you know, six weeks before the books due, and I'm finally coming to the realization that I'm not going to be able to do the travel. Well, Mark, Google maps. One of the Google things maps. I love about court <laughs> is his humanity. Um, he's fallible. 
he uh he's not he, he has incredible skills but he's not this superhuman character yeah. and relentless begins with court in pretty poor shape to say the least yeah um was that a difficult balancing act saddling him with that extra obstacle um where it you know heightened the tension but not so much that you like lost the gray man of old yes um i I have come to realize that I'm a very insecure author by speaking to like more secure authors and, <laughs> and I'm a big second guesser. And, and there were many times I was writing the book. I'm like, should I shuck this entire plot line that he's recovering from? Uh, he has an infection. We, you know, it's this, this is the opening of the book. He has an infection um, in his bone that he, he'd acquired from an injury that he received in the previous books in the previous novel. And I, you know, did question over and over, okay, is this going to sat, is this going to make him boring or whatever, but he's still able to do the things he needs to do. He has to use his wits a little bit more. He has to sort of uh, spend a, a little bit of the book working on how he's going to be, uh, you know, how he's going to treat himself on the run in this in in the story and i thought it was interesting i'm always thinking of the what happens w within the front and back cover of the story but also within in the larger story arc of the entire novel and i just felt like um you know he he takes a lot of damage as as the story goes on and i don't want every book just to be this it's this clean slate and he's at 100 percent. so I, I thought i thought it was kind of important for people that have been through the entire series to see this you know human side of him that he's um, struggling with some things you also see that the cia doesn't really give a damn <laughs> that he's struggling with these I, things yeah, they, they no need doubt. him more than they you know need him uh you know happy and feeling good so it was, I thought it added an interesting element to the story. It was interesting for me to write about it. Um, I suffered a similar injury years ago. And, uh, and so I know what it's like, the treatments for it and how important it is that you get your like daily infusions and, and all this sort of stuff. And I didn't want to make it a major part of the story, but I wanted, I wanted you to see that the, that the gray man had to do all these important things throughout the story but at the same time he had to sort of <laughs> go back and do a little self-care here and there and I just thought it was an interesting thing and if you haven't read a gray man book um you you basically see this you know uber assassin this amazing character cut down a notch and doing you know doing what he has to do to overcome I thought it was handled perfectly I just was curious if it was I it as I was reading and I thought, man, this has to be a hard balancing act, like making sure that, you know, you, you put all the detail in that of all the things he has to deal with and yet yeah. make it believable that he's able to overcome it. And I thought, again, yeah, right. He, he couldn't, you know, fight this entire fight on a stretcher. <laughs> it's not right. like that at all. He just uh, basically is, is very aware of the fact that there's sort of a, a time bomb ticking with inside him. Uh, just it just throws another clock you guys know your thriller writers you guys know that you know you you need some sort of ticking clock in the story and I like more than one ticking clock <laughs> well you can be hey, successful Mark, and still die <laughs> yeah Mark you I, talked you talked you talked about not being uh like you know you question whether it should be in there do you do you uh do you use your editor you use Tom as a sounding board on that or is that something you just internalize yourself and you're like this is what I'm going with I absolutely use Tom as a sounding board. It's funny you say that because we're we're working on book. I'm working on book eleven now, and and spent a, an hour on the phone with Tom today talking about hmm. some misgivings I have here and there. Um, for that specifically, I don't remember that I talked to Tom about it. I think um, I was a good one third of the way through the book, and and telling myself, you know, I may end up editing this whole thing about him you know, this mm -hmm. whole subplot, but that's, that subplot actually integrated into the main plot in the last act of the book in a way that what it, that, that it was rooted into the story and it was going to stay there. It's pretty cool. Well, well, from the, uh, the first novel, you've developed key supporting characters that readers have come to know and love or, or love to hate throughout mm -hmm. the series. You've moved on from some of the early ones and added new ones along the way. Do those characters force themselves into a more prominent role as you write them and get to know them better? Or have they pretty much gone to script as as you first envisioned them? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, yes, they, they have taken on roles uh, outside of what I initially thought. I mean, people ask me all the time, you know, did you plan this series out? How far did you plan it out? And, you know, you go back to my first book, I'm basically, I'm just trying to get a book deal. You know, I'm not thinking about book two or three or five or 10. <laughs> I'm just trying to like get someone to, you know, to publish this one. And it's the same thing. I, I have these characters that come in and I'm not really sure what's going to happen to them. Um, I had a, a villain in one of my books, Agent in Place, that I had every intention of him getting killed. And then late in the story, and I was like, you know, I kind of like this guy. I could use mm. him again someday. I don't know mm. if I will, but, um, you know, he, he actually survives the story. And, um, so it, it's kind of dictated by the story. This book, he does, as you said, he, um, they do have the side characters that, uh, that people that have read the entire series have, have come to get to know. And, and they fit this particular story. It was important that they were in the story for, for things that were in the story and not just because, hey, we have to see what Zoya is doing or we have to use Zach, you know, we have to check off that box that we have all these same characters in. Mm -hmm. They're not in all of the books, right. um, but I, I felt like it, it made sense to have them in these books, in this book. Yeah. And they have a familiar tone to them too when you pick them up after, uh, after a couple of times. And that's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of like looking at like family album of Uncle So-and-So who you haven't seen in a while. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, what, that's what I want. I mean, I, I want there to be uh, a consistent way that every, everyone talks to one another and, uh, you know, personalities don't change. That's a tough thing for me as a writer. Um, if I'm trying to put some humor into the story or something like that, sometimes the line that it, that is humorous is going to come out of the mouth of somebody that really wouldn't say that, you know, and you're like, damn, that would have been, you know, really cool, but it just doesn't really fit. I feel like once or twice I've just let it go and I've like had the person that wouldn't say that line say that line because there's no other way to do it. And I, dude, you're the I, author. You can do whatever yeah. you want, man. <laughs> I am the author, but they, they say kill your darlings. And I do have these darlings and I, I allow them to live. Yeah. yeah. Even unfunny people every now and then have a good line. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's, that's, that's how I find so. We won't mention any names. The, the tone of Relentless for me, and it, there's been some hints at some of your answers. Um, it was a, kind of a heavy dose of espionage, spy elements, particularly with the choice of location that kind of kind of brought out a little like horror theme storyline for me. Um, was it your intent to take that vector, which you kind of hinted at, but how much of that really was how the manuscript unfolded naturally versus what you had sort of planned out for this whole thing? Uh, the, yeah, the story unfolded, uh, expanded naturally. This one was not that much plotted out. I mean, mm -hmm. I basically had some places I wanted to go along the way, but it wasn't uh, super plotted out. So uh, the espionage stuff is very interesting to me. I've read all the Le, Le Carre stuff. I've read so many books about espionage in Berlin from the 1920s to, yeah. to the present. So it was kind of, um, that's when I think of Berlin and, and you know, I had, I, I, had the, I had kind of the framework of the story, but I wanted to put in as much of just the hard scrabble, espionage, trade craft and, and that sort of thing. There, there's a lot of actors in this story and there's a lot of um, double crossing and backstabbing and all those sorts of things that you would expect from a spy novel and i wanted to integrate them but but it did get bigger and bigger as the story went on mm. i don't want to give away um too much of a plot detail but i think this is this is in a lot of the summaries there's a private intelligence firm that figures into the plot of relentless um in in our world we've seen military veterans particularly special operators go into military contracting at an increasing rate is the same thing occurring in the intelligence field or is this kind of a, a fictional device you came up with? I mean, will we see a private competitor to the various national intelligence agencies who works for profit rather than country? Well, I actually got the idea for this entire novel um, from a few different articles that I read. I wasn't even looking for, you know, I was just doing some reading and I just read that the United Arab Emirates, the, the CIA has a, an agreement with the UAE because basically the, the, the 
the U.S. set up um, the uh, the Emirates uh, spy service. They have a they have an agreement. They don't spy on. It's a, they're a friendly nation, and we do not spy on the UAE. Well, we spy on a lot of friendly nations, and it's yeah. kind of a strange arrangement to basically say, okay, we will not spy on you guys. Um, well, the UAE has has done some things, even though they're ostensibly an ally. They've done some things that I thought were really, really interesting and, and worthy of looking into. And one of them is they have this company that was founded in the UAE called Dark Matter, and they hired former um, NSA uh, intelligence people, former Mossad and all that. And, and they, they do mostly cyber warfare, computer hacking and computer espionage and that sort of thing. But then people that, that had worked for Dark Matter in, in Dubai have come back to America and said, yeah, the, the, U, the Emirates are spying on Ameri Americans um, through mm -hmm. hacking. They, they do uh, specifically some like, you know, cracking into cell phones and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a real, real thing. At the same time, the UAE, United Arab Emirates, um, also has contract has, has hired American mercenaries to fight in their civil war in Yemen and with, with Iran and well with yeah. by proxy with Iran. <laughs> uh, so, so there's Americans uh, that have been fighting in Yemen and not just fighting, doing specific targeted killings in Yemen. And it's mm -hmm. a gray area to where it's not against the law for a former Green Beret to take a job working for the United Arab Emirates as a, on a on a hit job in mm -hmm. or Sana or something like that, and you know just reading all that and putting it together, your sort of thriller brain uh, just emulsifies that and puts it together, and, and next thing you know, you have you have uh, a story. But it's all based on truth. Mm. There's a lot of money they splash around on the Middle East to yeah, get for uh, sure. Right, so they have so much money, you know. It's like they have the deep pockets, and that 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 happened. In, that's one of the things in this novel. They're trying to figure out who's behind this, and it's like, well, is it the Mossad? Is it America? And it's like, well, it's somebody that's got a lot of money, so that narrows it down. <laughs> somebody that has that has some sort of a vested interest in. Yeah. in yeah. Well, well, let's go back to the uh, supporting characters for a moment. None of us ever want you to stop writing Greymont, Greyman novels, but have you ever thought about doing a Zach Hightower or Zoya story? Maybe not a novel, but like a novella. Yeah, I think it would be fun. I'll, they're just yeah. two characters that I really love to write. Um, Hightower especially. Uh, I mean, not especially, but I mean, Hightower is fun to write. Zoya is, uh, is also fun to write, but um, Hightower and his kind of weird moral code and his sense of humor and kind of his background uh lends itself to like you know what i think about and what i what i would have fun doing um and i i've considered it i nothing's come up i mean i've been asked to write sort of novellas or or like sort of novel little novellas to go between books and stuff like that in the past but I, I write two books a year and it just totally fills my plate. So yeah. um, people have asked me to like, you know, write a short story or this or that. And it's just kind of like, I don't know when I do that. I, could, 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 Mark, could you do it? Could you, could you cram in a story the way you write into 40,000 words? Yeah, I think so. Uh, 40, yeah. I, I wrote some novellas before I got published. And it, it really was a, a good lesson for me because it, you know, they, they, they weren't as long as novels, so they don't take as long as novels. They're about 25,000 words. They have a beginning right. and a middle and an end. And then you go back and you edit them and you do this and that. Huh. They were never published, um, but I'm proud of them. And, and I think I learned a lot from them. And I did tell a story in 25,000 words, a short story, forget about it. I couldn't tell. <laughs> I mean, unless the short, the short so story was like your hero yeah. tying his shoes or something like that, and I've got two thousand <laughs> words to do that. In. Uh, I, I, I want to see Mark. I want to see you do flash fiction, yeah, you know, like hundred word. I, I read. I see that stuff on the internet. I'm going like, oh my god, I would be so awful at that. And even when people say, "What's your book about?" I'm like, 
well, I'm the guy that took 160,000 words to, to write the book. So I'm the last guy that you want to ask <laughs> about. And I did when my new books come out. His I, appendix I, is longer than that. Yeah, I read like these, uh, I'll read a review and there'll be kind of a summary of what the story is about. And I'm like, I'm stealing that. I'm stealing that right there because I, can, I can't explain what my book is, is about. This person did it in you know, a paragraph. So, wow. Um, yeah. Hey, there's always something new to learn from every book written. Um, and you had quite an exciting year personally, as well as professionally. So would you say that there's anything new that you learned about yourself, about the writing, about some of the topics you researched along the way? What, what were some potentially key takeaways that you, that you got out of writing Relentless? Um, yeah, books get harder and harder to write the more that you write uh relentless when it, it you know it it's my 20th novel i i was the ghost writer on a couple of books so my name doesn't appear on that so if somebody tries to look at all 20 of my novels they'll see 18 but <laughs> i uh, i've had this is my 20th to be published and they don't get easier they do get tougher because you just don't want to cover ground you've covered before yeah. and, I think I might be a little hypersensitive to that because I will think, well, this isn't really the same thing, but it's kind of similar to this ghost writing thing that nobody knows I wrote in the first place, but I still won't, I still won't do, use it again. Um, so as, as I matured as a, as a writer, uh, you just get, you, you just have to absorb more information you have to just say nothing's off the table. I can have a conversation with somebody at a, at a gas station tomorrow and something in there um, might jog a thought. I've, I've gotten ideas from books from like video game app, you know, like, a, like phone video games or not, not entire books, but like little things that happen in books and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you just have to learn to pull from different things. And I think, um, as I said before, I'm not the most confident, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real second guesser. And, I, I, but having done this as many times as I've done it, that like this year, I was really stuck on this book for a while um, hmm. and wasn't really sure where the story needed to go. And I just, instead of just going into complete freakout mode, I was like, you know what? You've, you've solved this problem. You've been here before, you've solved this problem before. So hopefully, uh, you know, it'll make subsequent books a little bit easier for me because I've, I've, I've learned to sort of take a step back and take a couple of breaths and, um, mm. and chill out instead of just, you know, getting anxious about not being where you want to be with the story. Good to find out. You know, I find that interesting. I mean, you, uh, you, you call yourself a second guesser in, in writing, but, you know, like whether this device is going to work, whether that plot line is going to work. But I wonder, um, because, you know, if you ask any aspiring writers, or published writers who have a couple books out and he's talking in the thriller genre and they talk about Mark Graney, like, dude, you're like, there's a pyramid you're near the top <laughs> or at the top, there's a pyramid. Right. And so, so you're that guy up there, right? Everybody, I would love my book reads like Mark Graney is the gray man. Oh, right. Nice. So I wonder though, with, with 20 books, do you still get that imposter Oh, that's I, have, I, talk about. I feel like I have it like nobody else has it, which I'm sure everybody was imposter. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, a, I'm even an imposter at being an imposter. Um, <laughs> no, I, I absolutely do. Um, there are times when I'm writing where I'm going like, oh yeah, this is yeah, people are gonna love this. I mean, I, 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 I'm honest. I mean, there, there are times when I feel but that, but there's a lot of times where I'm like, I've got nothing, or this is just crap, or Oh my gosh, you know, it's like you, this is not a, a different, unique way to do this. And what, what I've learned, another thing that I've learned is my books get so much, I, I don't hate my books by about the third draft. Like, uh, you know, I've, I've been through some editing. When I, when I turn my book into my editor, I still don't like it uh, because I just mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. it's not that I'm a perfection. I, mean, I am a perfectionist, although you have to understand the real term of, meaning of the word perfectionist doesn't mean that you've ever done anything perfectly. Yeah. It just means that like, you're just not satisfied until it is perfect. Well, it's never perfect and you're never totally satisfied. So that's what I am. And, and, but I have learned that, okay, even though this book is 95% done, it feels like a complete convoluted mess to me. 
but once I get it edited a couple times, then I'm going to like it. Then I'm going to sort of like solve for X here and there. And, and you, what happens, and you guys have probably experienced this too, you're writing a hundred or 150,000 word book and you just have it in your head. You're late in the story and you're like, yeah, but this doesn't jive with what this mm -hmm. earlier and, and this. And you can clean all that up in the editing if it doesn't drive you insane at the time. <laughs> mm, <laughs> and that's right. the problem is like, I, you know, I spend so much time going like this book is just crap because I know that there's a hole here and there's a hole there. And I've, I've slowly gotten to the point where I can say, okay, I'll go, I'll, I'll fix that in the, the next edit or the one after that. And it'll get, a, it'll get fixed before it gets published. But imposter syndrome is real. I, you know, I have people say just really, really nice things to me. And I think to myself, wow, that's, that's exactly how I thought, you know, this person's experience reading my book sounds exactly like my re experience reading a Clancy book in the 80s or Frederick mm -hmm. Forsyth or something like that. And I'm like, but it's completely different because it's me, you know, and it's like <laughs> this poor guy has been cheapened by the fact that he's read my book, you know, and, and I, I read something special. So it's just, it's something you deal with. Yeah, my my wife says like you know this imposter syndrome is so much better than the alternative which is yeah. you, like, you are imposter and hard, <laughs> hard to be around so i don't have that problem i know we all like loved that answer i think yeah, yeah. <laughs> feel better <laughs> but but hold on hold on a second he did say something about uh writing crap so there's mark greeny writing crap. crap and then there's like chris albany's writing crap in there <laughs> No, it's not the same type of crap. I mean, it, it, it's believe me. I, I, I'll show you guys all some no. crap. <laughs> I, 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 okay, I just like the, I like the part about being ninety five percent done and thinking that it's not working because that's I think that's the thing is as you approach the end, it's like geez, this is just not nearly as what I set out to do. And absolutely, and, and I I think it, I, I'm ninety five percent done with the book. It's due in two weeks. And I think if I died right now and somebody read it, they wouldn't know what the hell was going. On. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. probably not true, but but you know that that's, that's like, my operating principle. Uh, perfectionist. Well, let's talk about court for a second, specifically. Um, like like all great thriller characters, um, his life has been quite a roller coaster. Uh, <laughs> Um, you've been living with him for a decade now. Yeah. Do you ever feel guilty about the hell you put him through? I mean, can't you just let Court be happy every now and then? <laughs> yeah, I, gosh. And I'm I'm writing book eleven now, and it's like, oh, this is tough for you know, it's tough. For <laughs> he hates you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, James Rollins, and I know you've all read yeah, his. Yeah, we know James. Uh, yeah. He, yeah. he told me once. He's like, when it, when a reader tells you what it is they hate about your book, it's probably what it is they love about your book. So they right. hate a character, or they hate that the, the the hero has to go through all these, you know, situations. It's like, yeah, that's probably what's bringing them back <laughs> to yeah. read, read your next book. So I, I get emails all the time. It's like. Court needs a steady girlfriend and he needs a you know, <laughs> happy home life and he needs to relax and he needs to blah blah. And I'm like, you're not gonna buy that book. That's you're a romantic gonna, comedy. <laughs> yeah. You're not gonna buy the book where he's out cutting his grass and his wife, um, you know, <laughs> cooking an amazing meal and the two of them are gardening. You know, it's just like you're not gonna read that book. But yeah. That's not uh, what I'm gonna do. No. I'm going to date myself, but Cheers and Mood Lighting both sucked once the people got together, once they finally got together. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. tension's gone. So, what? Go ahead. Along the way, there are victories and there are wins and there is happiness and there is like cool stuff. And I, and, and I just love ups and downs in every type of the story, you know, um, mm, yeah. as far as, you know, like light and dark. So, but he, he lives a very difficult existence for a number of reasons. And, yeah. And I don't feel guilty, uh, you know, putting the book out where he gets his butt kicked. Again. This is kind of well. I, I did definitely ask that a bit tongue in cheek, but um, when you've had a character in your consciousness that long, in your mind that long, you think about them on every level. Yeah. Do they begin to feel like a real person? I mean, do you when you think about Court, do you begin to almost picture him as a real guy that you're just writing his life story? No, I don't really think in those terms. And it, um, and it's funny because I'll meet fans and they'll call me Court Gentry or, <laughs> or 
you know, this whole thing where it's like, I'll say something and they'll be like, well, court wouldn't do that or whatever. And, and I'm like, yeah, well, I exist and he doesn't. So I got that on. Um, court would have shot you for saying that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, there's so many, uh, you know, like I write other characters too and I write other things. I mean, he's, he's obviously super important to me as a, as a, as a character and I like building him and I like, him being realistic. I like, you know, when people say, how are you like your hero? It's like, well, Murphy's law always comes into my life and it always comes into his <laughs> life. You know? And uh, it's, 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 that's sort of it, you know, it's like, mm. um, you know, I, I, a similar sense of humor, although I'm a little bit more goofy and he's, he's a little bit more, you know, one liner ish because, uh, you know, I have a half a year to think up the one liner, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I, I, I don't really personify him and I don't really get that. It's, it's funny. I have some friends, great friends who are fantastic authors and every one of their tweets is about their hero as if they're a real person, you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, I'm not going to say names because it sounds like I'm criticizing them. I'm not criticizing them. It's just not how I see them. You know, it's just like, well, I, I write the court gentry books and I write the red metal stuff and I write the Clancy stuff and I write the armored stuff. And, and um, so he's, he's just as important to me as, as he, as he is to, you know, my biggest fan, but at the same time, um, I don't really personify him that much really. Yeah. Although I, having said all that, let me just say exactly the opposite. Um, I have met people <laughs> who work in the intelligence field or whatever and i go like oh my gosh that is this part of gentry or that part mm -hmm. of gentry you know so so he he's over the years he's become based on people that he wasn't based on when i wrote my first book because i didn't know any of these people yeah. so um in that way it's personified because I, it does it does remind me of you know this guy bob or, or whatever that, that i know mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we, all three of us, and a whole host of other people are super excited about the Gray Man Netflix movie. And so we know shooting starts around the corner, some changes here and there with the timing of COVID. Um, um, we've got Hollywood heavies, we've got Ryan Gosling, Chris Evans. Um, even, the, even the supporting cast is mind blowing, which is kind of the real trick of it. And yeah. with, you know, this movie is going to bring in a lot of new readers. So with such a huge production and such fanfare of this occurring, how concerned are you um, that the movie is going to influence or shape the thoughts of new readers of who Court Gentry is based on the movie versus what you spent the last decade producing for, for us in the thriller world? Yeah, good question. Um, to be perfectly honest, it doesn't matter to me. The, the, the movie is its own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I completely implicitly trust uh, Joe and Anthony Russo. Joe wrote the script, the last script that I read. I know there's been other uh, writers that have, have been involved in the screen, screenplay since Joe wrote his part. But I think he's gone back again after that. Uh, and, and he, he, got the character so much. I spent some time with, with the Russos uh, several years ago when they were working on the script and, and I, I absolutely trust them. I, I say I don't, I don't have a huge experience with Hollywood. I have a couple of projects in Hollywood, uh, Gray Man and something else. And um, I have this movie, uh, I, I initially sold the option to this in 2009 and here we are in, in 2021. And Jeez supposed to start shooting March 1st um, but everything that Joe Russo has told me has come true you know like the the mm -hmm. way that he said you know we're going to get another shot at this we're going to we're going to do it this way at, at one point because there had been earlier screen screenplays written by other screenwriters and they had changed lots and lots and lots of things and when I was working with Joe uh, just talking to him before he wrote the screenplay I kept saying like well you know, in the book, this happens, you might want to go in a different direction. And, you know, I don't know what you're going to do, but in the book, this happens. Hmm. And at, at one point, he just kind of looked at me, he's like, I, th I think you're not understanding that we want to, you know, replicate this book as best as possible. And um, that's fantastic. That's pretty cool. Having said that, it's a movie, it's a whole different medium, it's a yeah. whole different thing. And people are going to be 
you know, I, I've had so many people that are like, you need to have complete say so on this, this, and this. And I'm like, well, I'm not Stephen King and I'm not John Griffin, <laughs> and I don't have that. I don't have any say so whatsoever. They could do whatever they wanted with, with the film and they yeah. almost did once. <laughs> Sony <laughs> almost did once. <laughs> do something, you know, a, a real departure from the story. But I, I know these are incredibly good filmmakers. The actors that are involved um, are, yeah. are really, really good. And uh, I couldn't be happier. But at the end of the day, and, and I don't know how this makes me sound, but this is just honestly, this is because I know the three of you guys, it's just like the four of us talking. This isn't like for, for wider distribution. No somewhere, one's going to watch this. Somewhere my publicist is like freaking out. <laughs> but at the, at the end of the day, I, I see the film as like the world's best possible commercial for my novels. Mm -hmm. You know, Hell yeah. right. I want, you know, and I'm a writer. And so, you know, it's, it's not even about money or anything. It's just like you want people to read what you've written and mm -hmm. like what they read. Right. And it just doesn't go further than that to me. And I, and I'm, I will be so lucky if they, you know, when, when this film comes out, I know a lot of, I have a lot of good friends who are authors who are every bit as good as I am that don't have an, a, a movie imminently about to shoot. Right. Um, so it, there's a lot of good fortune here and I, I'm not, you know, dissing anything. I'm just saying like, to me, the books are their own thing and the, the movie is its own thing. And hopefully the movie will bring some more people to, to, to read the books. And if they say, well, gosh, the court gentry in the film is a little different than in the books. I'm like, well, keep reading the books because he, he might be, you know, he, he, <laughs> that's who he is in, in, in the books. If you, if you like it, you'll keep reading. Yeah. Well, this is going to be a tremendous for you, I can tell. Well, well you usually, survived again. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wait, 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 Mike. Just barely. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Sean, Sean, got something. What's up, Sean? So you, you... No, you alluded to this, but, you know, to have the Russo brothers is not like having just anybody, you know, in control of your property. I mean, they, their track record, their recent track record is there's nobody better. Right. And uh, the, the authors that are have come in to rewrite it are their authors. I mean, Marcus and McFeely, you know, and those guys have have done some just some of the best some of the best scripts that there are out there. So, it you know, from a fan standpoint, I know it's not going to be exactly like the book. The movie's never exactly like the book. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm excited to see what this team does with your with your story. And I and I, you know, the worst thing that's going to happen is a bunch of people who've never read your books are going to pick it up because they saw the movie. They're going to go, oh wow, there's 10, 11 books by this guy. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick these up. So yeah. anyway, I'm, I'm excited about it. I think it's a, I think you're in the catbird seat. Thanks. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, it's uh, a very feel very fortunate for, for 12 years. I'm a very much a glasses half full type of guy. So there's so many people mm -hmm. that are like, oh, Not you much. must, this must be awful. That you must be awful <laughs> that you know they haven't made your movie yet. And I'm going like. <laughs> Yeah, but they say they're gonna, and you know, <laughs> like there's there's been a film option, and uh, the check's cleared, and you know, like uh, there's cool people that are involved in it, and I've gotten to hang out with them, you know. So I was always there, there's never been a point along the way where I've been like uh, this whole this not worth it, and blah blah blah. You know, it's it's all been like um, you know, this is just a neat little bonus that hopefully will play out someday. Oh yeah. Well, it's gonna, I'm going to watch it a million times myself. So, whatever that. <laughs> well, you survived the main portion of the interview. This is mm, always the, the point portion. where no, Mark starts to really break out into a cold sweat. Yeah. Sorry, dude. That's all right. This is called the lightning round folks. Mark is well familiar with this and uh, we'll hear his nervous chuckle and laughter in his voice. So last um, year, <laughs> if I can interrupt. So yeah, last please. the lightning round, you said, something like the the best three-piece band from canada and i i looked at you like i just hear in the head like looks i'm like well obviously it's rush it's like what idiot wouldn't say rush i don't, I don't like like so i'm sitting there going like well a triumph is good and there were three of them and, and then afterwards you said that you're you're riffing on simon who's the greatest oh yeah the nicest guy that any of us know i don't Beautiful i don't know man. everybody you know you don't know anyone but buddy nicer core great writer just good absolutely dude. uh simon gervais a canadian author and yeah. uh and then you then you explained to me that he didn't know rush and, I, and then I, like i watched that uh, i watched this interview later and i was going like i look like a moron like i'm afraid <laughs> to say the word rush well, but that, was our, that was our fault that was our fault but that's you know, like 
is this this got to be a trick question <laughs> well it was for simon <laughs> it was oh, simon. here i am he, a, hey he was prepared a later he was prepared in a sec was his that? second appearance, he was prepared for the lightning round. Yes, he was. <laughs> he gave as good as he got. Did he listen yeah, to? He, he, he listened to twenty one twelve by then. And he, yeah, he yeah. knew. <laughs> All right, I'm the host today, so I'm going to serve it up first here. So, uh, question number one: A nervous Tom Colgan asks, asks, with such a bustling new household, were you able to negotiate a no fly zone somewhere under your roof to escape to work, or is that never going to happen? It really has not been a problem. So yeah, so I got married in September. Um, my wife has uh, three children, so now I have three. Congrats! Yeah, Thank congrats you. on that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Um, I have three stepchildren, and I sort of, you know, was concerned. You know, <laughs> the the one thing is, I I'll take one of the the kids to carpool and uh i start work around eight whereas you know back in my early days i'd start work at 5 30 because you know i could what else are you gonna do yeah what else <laughs> well, exactly what else is i gonna do I'm gonna around my <laughs> so that's changed but i have a um fortunately the house when, when we looked at this house we've been looking at houses and when we walked into this house um i saw it at 10 o'clock in the morning is when i first walked through the vo door I had signed the contract to buy it at three o'clock that afternoon. Yeah, you know. And, no, and it awesome. basically, yeah, we know. There, there was a, there's a lot of great things about the house and it, it works for the entire family, not just me. But there's a guest house in the back that the, um, that the previous owner had built for his mom and dad. So his mom and dad lived in the, in the back house. And so this back here is, a, is my office, but it's also a full house and there's a guest bedroom. Uh, awesome. there's a, a laundry room which is where my printer is and filing cabinet <laughs> and all these things that you need to have when you're an author and um and it's worked out really great and the kids come back here and I've, I've told them you know they come and they knock on the door and I'm and I'm like you never have to knock you always have to come in and now I've got a book coming out and we're doing it all virtually so now I'm like don't you come through that door <laughs> put a sign on the door and it's like under penalty of i'm taking your phone away come through that door so yeah for for the six month um sort of like easing in grace honeymoon period i was like hey kids whenever you want to come in just yeah. pop in. and they really didn't because there's really nothing interesting back here so, so uh, well, i have a place to escape when you're have, in trouble yeah i have carved out a place which is exactly 30 steps away from the back door of my house um, and I feel like I've got my own office and I'm miles away from home. So Very nice. That'll put him at ease. All right. Yeah. Number two, <clears throat> how often does your lovely wife insist that as the creator of the gray man, she should be allowed to spend quality time helping Gosling and Evans rehearse their scenes. <laughs> she won't admit, uh, she, she, she won't admit that she has any, uh, concern or interest at all in that. Uh, the, the, my, Two stepdaughters, however, are very Ooh. excited, very, very excited, <laughs> um, and and that's really awesome. It's fun. Uh, it's fun to be in this family when all this came to pass. You know, it, it's really neat. Um, my editor and everybody at my publishing house kind of tease me when, like, you know, when my book hit number one and they called and told me, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's fantastic, and they're like, that's all you can say, and it's like. <laughs> That's how I emote, you know, it's like I'm a hundred percent as excited on the inside as anybody else is, but it was so fun. Like back in July, when they said they were going to, uh, Ryan Gosling was in the role and they were going to start shooting on the film in, in, you know, the winter, uh, I couldn't wait to run and tell my then fiance, you know, and if it had just been me or if it had been my previous life or whatever, it would have just been this thing like, well, I'm super excited, but I have to pretend like I don't care and <sighs> I'm going to be around people that are going to be kind of dry about it and be like, well, that's nice, you know? Yeah. And I was sort of surrounded by that. And uh, now I'm surrounded by people that are just real excited for everything that's going on. And, and that makes that's it a awesome, lot of dude. Not to get super like uh, sappy and cheesy, but, but it's, no, it's, thank God for that. That's no, fun. but that's what yeah, makes dude, life that's worth awesome. living, man. You deserve it. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. life. That's, okay. that's, that's the awesome. best part of life. Yeah. All right. Number three, what is the code <laughs> word for the Mark Graney discount at the movie box office? 
when it's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's nothing in the contract that says I get a free ticket. Well, it's well come on. Netflix, and I'm going to pay uh, whatever it is. 13 bucks a month. There I was going to say, it, it, it went just went up, right? Yep. I'm going to pay the same 13 bucks anybody else is to... to to um to watch it maybe it's hashtag court gentry or something well <laughs> you give that a shot um yeah. hopefully yeah. there's a film release with it as well um, That'd be I mean, fun. so they they it, it's fascinating to me they they've cast a, an indian actor this um yeah man, i saw that yeah Danush, yeah who i was not familiar with and i think he he really hasn't done anything in hollywood but they cast him and i have thousands of new twitter followers he so um for some reason david harbour from stranger things follows me on twitter and he has a million you know twitter followers i i have like ten thousand or i don't know what i have some six thousand or whatever i don't have anything special and then danush followed me uh this indian actor who's going to be in the gray man um i I, I assume he's like the head of one of the kill teams that's after yeah. in, the, in the first book. Uh, and he, I looked at, I looked him up and I was like, oh, wow, he's following me. That's cool. He has 9.7 yeah. million followers. <laughs> you know, it's like he's a very big deal, you know? Okay. And uh, I don't know. That's, that's just, funny that's how you're all the total ball, me. But, but my whole point of saying that is like, I assume it's going to be in the theaters in India when, when this oh, yeah. happens a year from now or a year well, from now and their netflix numbers are going to be out of this world over there yes. too yeah i would, I would think so. yeah they're so committed to their their celebrities as far as supporting them when they when they do mainstream hollywood movies it's i knew nothing about that until this happened and, and i just follow this guy and I, I watch uh videos of him and all this other stuff and i'm like so excited that he's a part of it and i, <laughs> I didn't know this guy from adam uh, you know a month ago it's pretty yeah. neat all right. Well, I'm up. My my first question: um, If I needed a laptop or an iPad killed, mm-hmm. you know anybody who might take the contract? <laughs> oh man, I'm your man. Uh, He's your guy. Yeah. I saw that. Uh, what you're referring to uh-huh. um, is uh, I posted something on the internet uh, the other day of me shooting up a laptop and an iPad, and uh, <laughs> my wife's family has a lot of property that is incredible incredibly remote it's so remote that there's roads that go through it like real like you know state highways or whatever and i've been out there several times and i've never seen a vehicle on them you know it's like <laughs> I, I could probably put, put a tent in the road and, spend it <laughs> it and not have to worry about it um, that's cool but, it, but it's beautiful out there it's an hour from memphis and it's, it's just beautiful and and it is uh, a place where we're redoing this uh, kind of dilapidated cabin out there, and I'm going to build a, a gun range. And oh, in the sorry. meantime, there's a berm out there. So every time we go out there for anything, I'm bringing one of my weapons or another. I, I have a, I bought a, a, a few new uh, rifle, like uh, pistol caliber carbine, like little short yeah. barrel rifles. Um, and I've taken them out there. And then the other day, I had to go up there for something and um, I had a couple of old computers or a computer and an iPad and it's like you, you know, the, you can recycle them, but at the same time, you don't necessarily want your information to be you know, mm-hmm. optimized in any way. So I can beat them up with a hammer or I can shoot them with an AK-47. So <laughs> for I, I, I put work. them on the berm and, and uh, put about 90 rounds through these uh, one <laughs> Apple product and one um, one IBM product. And they both fared equally as poorly, I guess. At the end of the How'd that day. feel? How'd that I feel? It was a hell, hell well, of a, it's a lot of fun. Blocks. You know, uh, you know that if anyone who's seen the movie Office Space, if, if you're over the age of 35 and you haven't seen Office Space, then you're you're missing something. <laughs> uh, hopefully, you would enjoy it. But I mean, Office Space was a uh, you know reenactment of my life at the time <laughs> you know, around 2000 when it came out. And uh, yeah, they had this thing where they where they torture a printer to death because printers suck and, <laughs> uh, and I, I guess you guys have all seen it sure yeah yeah oh yeah oh yeah anybody want to you know admit to not having seen office space and we can make fun of you i make fun of people all the time for not seeing it so. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway yeah so um yeah I, they they beat it to death they beat a printer to death with a baseball bat and um i shot up a couple of computers <laughs> i'll do it. ammo 
Yeah. Okay. My second question, and we've, we've touched upon the fact that you got married to the lovely Allison this year. Yep. Has anyone made the egregious and possibly fatal mistake of referring to her as the gray woman? Oh my gosh. They would, they would not live long. If they did. <laughs> I think that should be your grandparents' name. Yeah. <laughs> the kids should call you gray man and gray woman instead of grandpa and That's grandma. That's hilarious. Yeah. No, no one has called her that. And she's <laughs> about six feet from me right now. So uh... <laughs> I might be in trouble. You might have gotten me in trouble. Yes. Good <laughs> job, Sean. Uh, she she just said someone has called her the gray woman. So uh, ooh. Yeah. sorry to hear that. Bastard. Yeah. yeah he's dead. No, Let them know where they yeah. tell, tell us where they live. We'll, Josh we'll, Hood. Yeah, we'll, we'll get them. Yeah. All right. My last question is really not really a question. It's more of a request. I would like you to, when you have a chance, go back and review the last time you were on for one minute out mm -hmm. and watch the lightning round. And what your answer was to me in that interview. Mm -hmm. Because as I read every page of the latest book, Relentless, yeah. there was something that didn't occur that was promised in that interview. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but if you tell me again, I promise that I'll do it in Sierra Six in my next. But my, I'm, I'm joking, but my lightning round question to you was Will you put me in the next Gray Man book? And you said, oh, Yes, I will. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, you know, one minute. Out, would you have wanted to be in that book? No, no, no. no. We were talking about one minute. We were talking about Relentless. Oh, you're talking about Relentless. Okay, yes. all right. So, yeah, oh, the next book. Yeah, um, yeah. There, there probably was a spot for you. And it I doesn't look Turkish. It's okay. It's okay. I got over it. I got over <laughs> yeah. it. The book was good enough that you know, if, if the book would have sucked, then you would have seen me on Twitter going, "This book sucked." <laughs> Let me tell you why. This man made a promise. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I, I feel like I need an Irish setting or a Scottish setting to really, you know. That's, yeah, we better get the islands in there. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm actually mostly Polish, but the name, yeah, you're right. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have, uh, the first two questions I have for you are, how old were you when you found out? And then the last one's going to be an animal question. So how old were you when you found out <laughs> the division symbol is just a blank fraction with dots replacing the numerator and the denominator. Mm, God, when was the last time I was a nerd? I mean, it was probably <laughs> like uh, my late teens. Yeah, <laughs> probably my late teens before I realized that stuff like that it was pretty nerdy. <laughs> what do you want? All right, and uh, the next one is: uh, How old were you when you found out screwdriver screwdriver handles are designed to put a wrench on it to help loosen up tight screws? I didn't know that. Is that real? Yeah. yeah. 50. The answer no. is 50 for me. <laughs> 56. Well, I, I, so. um, I, I, is that for people that don't have the strength to turn a screwdriver? Is that? Oh, see. Oh, there you go. Mm, I like how you did that. That was good. That was good. service agents or. <laughs> mm -hmm. I looked, All right. So my last question. I looked so bad on the rush question last year that I feel like I've got to fight back on each one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's your chance to really fight back. You and I both love animals. Yeah different types of animals uh -oh. so if you woke up tomorrow and all of your dogs had turned to cats what would you do well i'd sneeze um for starters um i've got a bit of a cat dander allergy or whatever but i uh, I, I like cats i don't have anything i mean i have never had a cat of my own but my i had a cat growing up or I had cats growing up and um, like my brother who, who works with me and my sister-in-law who work with me, they have, they have a cat and it's a cool cat. And previous to that, they had another cat. So I'm, I'm, I'm pro living things, you know? <laughs> all right. All right. But you will admit the dogs. If a, if a cockroach like falls on me right now and I jump like a little girl, then you'll be thinking I'm not pro all living things. But. That's the next book. <laughs> yeah, that's the next book. But you will admit the dogs are in fact way superior to cats. Yeah. You, uh, you will admit that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. 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 That's a no I mean, a, a, a dog will pull you out of a burning building a cat will just watch Laugh. from the car <laughs> that's a cat that the cat lit on fire yeah exactly. <laughs> oh mark it it's so wonderful having you back on the show pal yeah, yeah. thanks for having me this is my empty uh, glass yeah but, well it means a good show i gotta get moving here mm. hey folks relentless is out it's fantastic we all loved it uh and the setting in berlin was was really a treat because it really took all of us back to earlier times and earlier parts of our lives when we enjoyed those types of espionage and, and spy thrillers. So um, 
this was fantastic. We love having you on. Anytime we can help you out, please, uh, please let us know. Thanks so much, guys. It's, it's great. Anyway. To Cheers to you, pal. Cheers. Yeah, sure. All right, boys. We had the incredible Mark Graney on the show today with his 10th Gray Man novel out, Relentless. Yes. We all read it. We loved it, as always we do. And join us every Monday for another amazing guest. Let me click on the gentleman here. Boom. Raise up and toast to one of our favorite authors. It's a good show. Great show as always. Let's do it. <laughs> you guys are going to play this in your bloopers. No, no, we're not. No, we don't. No, this is my personal like vault. I'm, 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 I'm so blooper ready now. Uh,